Hello and welcome to this session, The Law of Thinking. And I think by the time you spend a little time with Bob and me on this lesson, you will agree with us that this is one of the most important laws that we're going to understand and then apply. What Hawley was referring to here, he, in fact, he even states it in the lesson. He says, attention should be given to the predominant mental state. And he begins the lesson by quoting Proverbs, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That is really the foundation of a person's life, if we stop and think about it. It's the first step to freedom, because we're programmed genetically and environmentally. And so we're really the product of somebody else's habitual way of thinking until we get to a point where we start to understand we truly do have control over our life. We have the control over the growth of our business. The economy doesn't control our business. We control our business. And when we can see this and really understand it as a person thinketh in their heart, we're talking about the heart of hearts. We're talking about their emotional mind, not just their intellect. Right. And I think that's the key to it. And, of course, he points out here that to the average person, life's an enigma. It's a deep mystery, a complex, incomprehensible problem, or appears so. But it's actually quite simple. And I think, as Hollywell stated, mystery is just another word for ignorance. That's right. Part of our open door into this freedom and the understanding and the experience of the power of this law, that as we think, so our life becomes, is to begin to pay attention to what it is that we're thinking. And so when he describes that it's a mystery until we begin to notice that what we're thinking and what we predominantly focus on begins to manifest and show itself in our everyday life. Earl Nightingale said something very interesting one time many years ago. He said that if the average person said what they were thinking, (laughs) they would be speechless. And of course, I've quoted the late and great educator, Dr. Ken McFarland. He said 2% of the people think 3% think they think, and 95% would actually rather die than think. Now, you're going to find that the great mass of people say, well, everyone thinks. And the truth is, they really don't. Mental activity does not constitute thinking. Thinking is done in our intellectual or in our conscious mind. And of course, we've got our senses hooked up to our conscious mind. We see, hear, smell, taste, touch. There's an enormous amount of information being fed into our conscious mind. There's pictures and sounds and colors and God knows what that's fed into our conscious mind. So it's always busy. And I believe the average person mistakes that for thinking. When it's not thinking at all, it's just busy. Now, as Hollywell points out, man's a progressive being, a creature of constant growth, but only if he thinks. And if he's not thinking, he's not growing. That's why most people are stuck. Every year, they get the same results as last year. When Hollowell says, in his ruling mind, if his ruling mind is upward bound, that is aspiring, harmonious, and positive, then all the forces will be directed into constructive channels. But if the state of mind is downward in tendency, discord negative that all the forces will be misdirected so bob in your understanding of what it means to really think how does one begin to think more upward bound well i believe they have to start out by what do they really want Mm -hmm. what do they really want in life not what do they think they can get now what do they think they can do what do they really want We're discouraged to go after what we want. Most people are not even aware of that. But as little kids, we'll go, Mommy, Daddy, I want this. And they look at you kind of silly. Now, how are you going to do that? Mm -hmm. Or where's the money going to come from? And because the child can't answer it, they're stopped. And pretty soon they stop asking for what they want Mm -hmm. and they stop thinking about it. Because to get into what we want, we have to fantasize. And then we turn the fantasy into a theory. And that's when we really begin to think. So if there's going to be upward motion, upward movement or growth, we're going to have to think, but it's going to have to be directed towards a result that we truly do want, whether it's in our corporation or in our personal life or in our relationships. What do we really want? The beautiful thing is, and the beautiful truth is, that we can have anything we want. And it's my great hope that that's what everyone will get out of this program. They'll get an understanding that there are laws govern their being, and these laws will aid them in moving toward what they want. 
So in the law of thinking, when you were speaking to us about the difference between mental activity and authentic thinking, are you saying to us that your understanding of authentic thinking is that it is from the depths of our own creativity, from our desire of the Father, that in us that is not just based in our five senses, but in our, our soul or our greater being? What is it that is generative in us that is seeking expression? I believe we're spiritual beings. So being spiritual beings, I like the way James Allen put it, we're an offspring of a deathless soul. So in other words, we're hooked into something that goes on ad infinitum. There is no death. However, I believe that the essence of the human, of you, of me, and every person is perfect. There's perfection within. It's spirit. And spirit's always for expansion and fuller expression. So there's something within us that wants us to move to a higher level. And to move to a higher level, it's essential that we think. There's pure, unadulterated spirit flows to and through us. And through thinking, we're taking that and we're creating thoughts. And then we take and join those thoughts together with other thoughts, and we form an idea. I see an idea as a thought or a collection of thoughts directed towards a purpose. So the want comes from the spiritual essence within us wanting to express itself in a greater way. Mm -hmm. So there's something we really want. Growth isn't about getting things, getting stuff. You will get things, you will get stuff, but it's about the growth. That's right. You know, we have goals, and the goals are material and nature, but that's the target that we're shooting at. We live in a physical body. We correspond with the material world, so it's natural that we'll have material goals. But it's not the goal that we're after. It's the growth that we're after. Our days should be spent doing what we love doing. I always say working's the worst way to earn money. Most people go to work to earn money. That's the worst thing to do. We should go to work for satisfaction because it's the instrument or the means of utilizing your creative abilities. And the Talmud says there's an angel leaning over every blade of grass whispering, grow, grow. grow, and, grow. Yes, and a blade of grass will press through cement seeking the light. And right now, between all of us listening to this, there is what seems like cement or what seems like a barrier between us and that which we're seeking. And these laws are what absolutely dissolves that cement or what those apparent blockages. So the law of thinking is that we think not based on what we see or hear or experience with our five senses, but we're thinking from a different level of our own being. I believe it's essential that a person stop on a fairly regular basis and take a look at their results and pay attention to their behavior and realize that this is nothing more than an expression of their thinking. And if they don't like the behavioral patterns they find themselves habitually involved in, if they don't like the results they're getting, then they know they have to change their thinking. Now, I don't know as we can actually monitor our thinking, because that would be an exhausting ordeal to do it constantly, but we should take a look at it every now and then. Raymond Hollowell brings it out here very well. He said, it is evident, therefore, that all of the factors which regulate the life and experience of the person none perhaps exercise a greater influence than the ruling state of mind. Mental attitudes are the result of ideas, and these have their origin in points of view. Therefore, by seeking true and natural points of view, one may secure the best and most superior ideas, and these in turn will determine the predominant state of mind." So what we're really looking for is real meaningful thinking, some pure and constructive thinking that's going to move us in the right direction. Like right in the beginning of these sessions, he suggests that you have real good and true reasons for all your convictions. Well, I think this is going to help you do that. I do too. And the idea that our point of view is the perspective that we gain from how we're thinking about things and what we're looking at. And we know that if we change the way we're looking at things, the things we look at change. So in the law of thinking, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And this chapter actually begins with a quote from the Bible that says, as a man thinketh from his heart, so is he. It's a proverb, which means it's just in the underground, in the general tone of how things work. How then are we to come to know what it is that we have been thinking in our hearts? We look at our results. And to do so on some regular pattern that gives us insight into the patterns of our thinking. And then what would you say? 
one does next is actually choose Well, yes, I think you have to choose the direction that you're going in your life, and very few people do. Mm -hmm. And if we want to know what we're thinking, the evidence is there. It's pretty simple. Ray Stanford, who's gone now, God bless him, will always stand out in my life because I believe he was the person that provoked me to begin thinking for probably the first time in my life. And I was 26. And some people say, well, you must have been thinking before that. I don't think I was. I think I was just following other people. I think I was just doing whatever was going on in my mind, and it was nothing but confused thoughts. There was no pattern to it because it was whatever was going on outside was controlling what was going on inside. You know, what you're saying right now is really big. I think that many people, myself included, have at times in my life had no idea that I'm not really thinking. I'm just the patterns moving through my being that have been around me, I've inherited, that I acquired, and those patterns have run my life, not knowing that I had a capacity and a power that I could draw from that actually would be the architecture of my life. If we look at a corporation and take a look at management, management's the development of people, it's not the direction of things, contrary to popular belief. And so, If a person is using this material for the development of their organization, it would be good for them to stop and ask themselves, what am I really doing? The first order of business is profit. Without profit, you're going out of business. But that's not the purpose of any human organization. The purpose of all human organization is to make life more meaningful. If we take the people out of the building, you don't have a company anymore. You've got a brick and mortar edifice with a lot of stuff in it. As I do a lot of seminars in hotels, I often point out to the audience that if we took the staff out of the hotel, we wouldn't be in a hotel. We'd just be in a building with a bunch of stuff. It's the people that make the hotel. Well, it's the people that make the company. Now, historically, corporations have not recognized the people as the greatest resource that they'll ever have. And Our first objective as leaders in an organization is to provoke the people to think, really get them to think about what they're doing, who they are, and the role they're playing. We're prone to believe more than what we see. The evidence of the senses are the only facts that some accept. But now we want to realize more and more that it's what we believe that determines what we see. In other words, believing is seeing. More defeats and failures are due to mental blindness than to moral deviations. If one lived only by the physical sight, the world would be very small. So I think we have to take our sights off just what's there in the physical plane and what can we see by it. It's like J.C. Penney one time was asked how his health was. And when he was 92, and he said that, you know, his sight was getting rather poor, but his vision had never been better. Uh Well, of course, it's with this inner eye of understanding that we see. And so if we believed in the testimony of our eyes, we would accept many conditions that are not true. For example, if we look down a railroad track and observe that at a certain distance, the two tracks converge at one point, we know that that's not true. So our eyes deceive us. Don't be deceived. So we're talking about an infinite power that operates in an orderly way. We have the ability to choose and the images that we choose, because when we think, we think in pictures. They're the things we're getting emotionally involved in, and that's really what keeps us moving, I believe, in an upward direction. And it keeps us moving in an upward direction through the law, which operates through the power that is everywhere present. So thought is a subtle element. Although it is invisible to the physical sight, it is an actual force or substance, as real as electricity, light, heat, water, or even stone. We are surrounded by a vast ocean of thought stuff, which our thoughts pass like currents of electricity or tiny streaks of light or musical waves. And you can flash your thoughts from pole to pole completely around the world many times in less than a single second. My great aunt was a Christian scientist. And as a little girl, I can remember her saying to me, Mary, now notice this. It doesn't take you any longer to think to New York than it takes you to think across the room. Pay attention to that. And as a little girl, I thought she was kind of, you know, as my funny, strange aunt, but it always stuck with me. That's very good. It doesn't take any longer. And the power of our thought is everywhere present. 
I was saying that just yesterday in a meeting, and I've been using an example now for some time to get that point across. Like I point out that thought waves are cosmic waves that penetrate all time and space. And you and I can think it's the most potent form of energy in existence so far as we know. Now, when you say that your thoughts are omnipresent, that they're evenly present in all places at the same time, that idea is so huge that most people have difficulty grasping it. I have several time with it myself. I wrestle with it. And then it dawned on me one day, with the computer in our life today, we can tap a mouse and bang, the email is where? It's omnipresent. It's 100% evenly present in all places at the same time. And it doesn't matter where you are, you will get it. It's like our thought. It's everywhere. I could be in Rio de Janeiro, or I could be in Moscow, or in New York. If I turn on my computer, the email's there. It's wherever I am. And that's like thought. And that's a huge idea. And so in the law of thinking, we are actually accessing infinite possibility, drawing from that a particular idea out of a desire, a want, a yearning, or a discontent. And I believe we are drawn to our next version or expression of self, our own evolution through both longing and discontent as helpful navigators to the conscious mind about a choice that is ours to make to coalesce around a thought form that actually gives rise to creation. All knowledge is 100% evenly present in all places at the same time. The way to build the Internet has always been here. That's right. The way for air travel has always been here. Friday afternoon, I was working in Los Angeles. Saturday afternoon, I was working in London, England, Saturday and Sunday, and Monday in Phoenix, Arizona. Now, at one time, if you had suggested that someone do that, you would have been considered a lunatic right Mm -hmm. out of your mind. But the way to do that has always been here. And, of course, there's faster travel than that. But that's what we're consciously aware of now. See, everything is already here. So it's not the answers that we have to be looking for. It's the questions that we want to be thinking. Because it's the questions that's going to trigger the answer. The answer comes with the question. What we want to realize is that this all starts in our thinking. Because it's the way we think on an emotional level. It's what we think inside, not just in our intellect. If we elaborate a little more on just going by what we see... I found a section in this particular lesson that Raymond Hollywell brought out that is absolutely incredible. You know, he talked about the train tracks, and then he talks about if you've ever stood on a boardwalk and watched a ship slowly sink into the sea as it sailed away. No, he said the ship wasn't sinking. Our eyes were deceiving us. Now, when you're worried over some obstacle or problem, just remind yourself that it may be purely an illusion of the senses, that it may not be true at all according to the law. He said, did you know that you don't even see with your eyes? Your eyes are like a pair of windows. At the back of the window, there is a reflector. And this reflector, in turn, forms an image of what you see and sets up a wave current. This wave current follows along thin wires called nerves. This relays the image back to the brain. Here at the brain, it's referred to the memory center. And he says the picture is a common one. Our memory accepts it readily. But if we're looking upon some new picture, some new scene, our memory does not recognize it. And then we must repeat that picture over and over many times until it makes a lasting impression. Therefore, We do not see with our eyes, we see with our mind. We actually see through our eyes. I was pointing out in a seminar yesterday, there was a person that we would refer to as a black person in the front row. I had black shoes on and a white shirt. And I said, so people will refer to you as black and me as white. I said, you're not black and I'm not white. My shirt is white, but I'm not the color of my shirt. My shoes are black. You're not the color of my shoes. Why do we say you're black and I'm white? It's because we've been programmed. So when we look, all this happened that Raymond Hollowell's talking about. It gets those reflectors working, goes into our memory. How did it get in our memory? Someone put it there. That man or woman is not black and this man is not white. So we not only see through our eyes, we're seeing things that aren't true, that are programmed into our mind. And we have limitations programmed in. It's a part of our being. We have to recognize that. And through our own intellect, we've got to have the wisdom and understanding to change what's programmed into our mind, or our life is not going to change. That's right. 
when he speaks about the power of this law of thinking, that as we begin to recognize that what we are made of is so potent and powerful and the capacities that have been given to us, we walk around every day, most of us having very small understanding and experience of the power that we wield for whatever we will. And the predominant thought patterns, as we think in our heart, create a life that could just as easily be one of fulfillment and enrichment and difference-making and good, or it's a life of littleness and struggle and difficulty, and all along the power to change the thinking is within us. You know, when you're saying that, what runs through my mind, and it runs through my mind fairly frequently because I mention that in seminars often, how small we think relative to what we could think. You and I have spent many, many, many years studying this, working at it, working with it, using it, teaching it, and yet as serious as students as we are, we're still little thinkers relative to what we can be. Mm -hmm. So an individual must understand that if they're really going to get out of life what they can get out of life, what we're promised and what's there— I love the way Raymond Hollywell put it. He says, power, possibility, and promise. It's all locked up. Then we have to realize that a certain part of our day, our life, is going to have to be dedicated to our own well-being, our own growth. So we've got to start investing time and money in ourselves. Corporations, we have to spend time and money in the growth of the individual. And we've got to move away from the school model of educating people. Because that's just, if we read the book, remember it, and we repeat it, then we've got it. Well, we know that that isn't true. We've got many brilliant people who are not getting very good results. We've got brilliant people who are broke. We have brilliant people who are alone and lonely. So we've got to understand the truth of what you're saying, that we are messing around with just little ideas of what we're capable of doing, and we've got to expand our mind, expand our thinking, and to do that, we're going to have to say, okay, from this point on, I take time to eat, I take time to groom myself, I take time to shower, I take time for many things, habitually, every day. From now on, I'm going to invest part of my money and part of my time into the development of myself. And I think that's the first step toward accomplishing what you're talking about. I do, too. And I think what we have done is we have learned to invest our time and energy in that which we have been taught to value. And why one would be listening to this lesson and to this series that you and I are doing is an introduction into shifting a value because the highest value of the development of the self, and that's with a capital S, is from that generates all the difference that can happen in life. When you were speaking earlier about the Internet being a grand opening of possibility, it reminded me of Edison. To activate this law of thinking, his desire was to create the first incandescent bulb. And he had no idea how to do that, but he had a belief that the infinite had a solution. You couldn't have a question without an answer or a problem without a solution. And he learned to do what people called Edison's catnaps. But he would sit in a rocking chair and hold a rock in his hand so if he went to sleep it would fall on the floor and awaken him. And he went to what he called the land of solution. He <laughs> practiced this law of thinking in such a way he would go to the land of the solution with a question and listen and ultimately generate enough ideas to come forth with what we call the first incandescent bulb. He named that lamp the Mazda lamp after the teacher Mazda who taught him this kind of meditating, quieting the mind, and listening to the depths where the answers are found. When we're talking about the difference between knowing about the law of thinking and knowing the law of thinking, you said many people are brilliant, but they're still living small lives. And we ourselves are living in a pygmy version of what we are each possible and capable of. So to activate the law of thinking is to bring it from knowing about the law of thinking and the power of it to knowing the law of thinking. And if we know the law of thinking, we are participating in exactly what you're saying, which is we look at our day and we recognize that part of our day has been devoted to the activation of that law in a deeper realm of our own being. I believe our educational system perpetuates the problem, doesn't solve the problem. 
Thinking is not taught in school. You say, well, you can't teach thinking. You can teach thinking. Thinking can be taught just the same as we teach mathematics, reading, science, history, or anything else. We can teach people to think. And we should teach them to think because it is such a potent force. Raymond Hollowell brings out the power of thought and what we're dealing with here very well. He said, scientists tell us that thought is compared with the speed of light. They tell us that light travels at the rate of 186,000 miles per second. Our thought travels 930,000 times faster than the sound of our voice. No other force or power in the universe yet known is as great or as quick. It's a proven fact scientifically that the mind is a battery of force, the greatest of any known element. Now, that was 50 years ago. Of course, that's changed. That's right. Our quantum science would say to us now that thought is instantaneous, that time is an illusion, and that in this, as Sheldrake spoke about, the unified field, why thought is so powerful. Everything he said here is true. It's evolved now in our understanding that it's even more powerful than that. It's instantaneous. Raymond Holly went on to say, it is an unlimited force. Your power to think is inexhaustible, yet there is not one in a thousand who may be fully aware of the possibilities of his thought power. Imagine a corporation that actually created a condition, a space in their workplace, in the corporation, where the conditions were conducive to best thinking. And part of every leader's role or every manager's role was to spend a certain amount of time weekly in that environment that had maybe sound sites, a space to sit in that was absolutely conducive to best thinking. For a long time, I felt like one of the clues we can each find in accessing the law of thinking is to begin to pay attention to where and when we individually do our best thinking. And I do my best thinking early in the morning. I have a routine that actually helps me access that part of me where regenerative thinking comes from. But I don't think many people are trained to know that they can actually understand or look for when they do their best thinking. Do you know, it's strange you mentioned that. I do my best thinking both late at night and early in the morning. I guess late at night, I'm just tired, and I just open myself up because I am tired and let it flow. Early in the morning, I'm rested. So, you know, yeah. both sides of it. Well, you know, what you were mentioning about a corporation, as Hollywell pointed out in this lesson, he said it's our power to think that determines our state of living. As one is able to think, he generates a power that travels far and near, and this power sets up a radiation which becomes individual as he determines it. Our thoughts affect our welfare and often affect others as we think of. Like the kind of thoughts we register on our memories or habitually think attracts the same kind of conditions. So if we were to take a corporation and do this. And there are many corporations that do this, as a matter of fact. This isn't just a, a wild idea that's come to your mind. There are generally smaller companies, but there are companies that take a specific period of time every day. They've created an environment that's conducive to the unfoldment of the human, where it's quiet, there's no disturbances, and it's used for thinking and planning on how are they going to improve the quality of the business. So if we're doing it in corporations... It makes sense because a corporation is a body of people for a specific good or desire in our individual. If we incorporate this idea ourselves and there's a part of our day where we create a condition that is conducive to great thinking and begin to recognize the power of that over time in our life, even if we make a one degree shift, you go a mile down the road, you're in a whole new place. So the idea of just as the corporation would create conditions for possibility thinking, if we will allow ourselves and devote ourselves to that in our daily life, just even a little bit, it can make a big difference over time. You know, I used an example like that in a program many years ago. I said, if you could imagine a road that was built and it runs straight as a die, let's say from New York City to Los Angeles, it just runs out like a clothesline. And there's a white line right down the center of the road. And somehow or another, we put an automobile on there and it was engineered and the steering was locked in such a way it could only travel straight down that white line. It's going to drive right into Los Angeles. But if the steering was turned just one sixteenth of an inch to the right, I think, you know, the car is never going to see the West Coast. And it's the same in our thinking. We make just a small shift in our thinking. We may not notice a big difference today or tomorrow, but over the period of a year, two years, five years, or a lifetime, 
the change is enormous. I can just go into my own life, and you think of this one-degree twist. I remember when I began my own business, I was working, I was the business. I was the only person in the company. And I made a small shift. Somehow or another, I realized that no one has ever built anything of any consequence by themselves. And so I got someone to help me. That was a small shift. Today, we have people all over the world. The company operates all over the world. But that one small shift is what really changed my life and certainly changed the business. It was the shift where it went from something small, and it was that small shift that kept it going into something big. But you said that shift came from a thought where you realized no one ever created something of consequence by themselves. And so it was from authentic thinking and the realization of that, that you were willing to make a different choice, follow that with a behavior, and the result was in the thinking. Our thoughts affect our welfare and often affect others that we think of. The kind of thoughts we register in our memories or habitually think attracts the same kind of conditions. If we take the thought of success and keep it in mind, the thought elements will be attracted, for like attracts light. We are mentally drawn to the universal thought currents of success, and those thought currents of success are existence in all of us. They are, and that we then psychically contact the mind or minds of others who think along the same lines. And later, such minds are brought into our lives. When Thoreau said that when we advance confidently in the direction of our dream— We pass an invisible boundary. All sorts of things begin to occur. And that's what Raymond Hollowell is saying here, is that this law is immutable, and we attract what we are. So when we're thinking along the lines of success, when we're in the frequency of the thing we want, we don't have to worry about how it's going to come to us. It's natural. Raymond Hollowell says, therefore, successful-minded people help success to come to them. That's how successful living is founded. The law of the mind is in perpetual operation, and it works both ways. Persons who dwell on thoughts of failure or poverty will gravitate toward like conditions. They, in turn, will draw to them people who accept failure and poverty. They accept it as a real part of life. On the other hand, we can think of positive conditions of success and plenty and in the same manner enjoy full and plenty. When What the mind holds within takes its form in the outer world. Some think that we must deal with two forces. That is, to attract the good, we must do away with the bad. But that's not true. For example, if we're cold, we do not work with cold and heat alike in order to get warm. We build a fire. And as we gather around that fire, we enjoy the heat that's extended from it, and we become warm. And as we build up the warmth, the cold disappears. We don't have to fight the cold. We just build up the warmth. So as we focus on and resonate with and become one with the ideas of that which we are seeking to express, as a man thinketh in his heart, There's actually a generative frequency that goes into the universe that attracts unto it its like. We call that our experience. That example of the heat and the cold, I think, is so beautiful. You know, you don't focus on the cold. You focus on the heat. Mm -hmm. That's how you eliminate the cold. I'm frequently asked in seminars, how do I get rid of the negative thoughts in my life? And I said, if you walked into your home in the middle of the night How do you get rid of the dark so you know where you're going? He said, I turn on the light. I said, there's your answer. Turn on the light. Light is consciousness. Flip your thinking. Get into something bigger. See the good side. That's how you get rid of the negative. You turn on the light. That's how you get rid of the cold. You turn on the heat. When people start to understand that, you attract whatever you focus on. That's, I think, when they start to take control over their life. You see, prosperity and poverty are not two things. They're merely two sides of one and the same thing. So it's like the hot and the cold. One coin, two sides. The dark and the light. And even biblically, get thee behind me, is that you get something behind you by turning your attention in the other direction. And that which we focus on expands. All our thoughts must be directed to the one thing that we desire in order for our desire to be fulfilled. The law of thinking is evidenced in the way it works in nature. Nature herself does not distinguish between 
what seed it receives. It just grows whatever seed is planted. And so it is in the way it works in life. Even though the universe is for our good and the law of life is for this ever upward expansion and freedom, when you and I get focused on that which is small or contractive or little, the universe can only grow for us that which we are planting. So Raymond Hallwall says it this way, the mind force is creating continually like fertile soil. Nature does not differentiate between the seed of a weed and that of a flower she produces and causes both seeds to grow. The same energy is used for both, and so it is with the mind. The mind creates either good or bad. Your ideas determine which is to be created. A person wants to stop and really pay attention to what the heck is going on in their mind. It's like I say, you're not necessarily going to monitor your thinking, but you take a look at your results, take a look at your behavior, and you're going to find that mind is the cause of the problem. If a person has fear, they want to replace it with courage. If it's disease thoughts, we want to replace with healthy thoughts. Force some issue whereby we alter the change, the trend of our thought. Then as we replace the thoughts that are the weeds, They're going to die by themselves just naturally, for such weeds die from lack of cultivation. As long as we allow things to seem real to us, we're putting our energy into it. And remember, it's all just our perception. It's our point of view. Mm -hmm. We can change our perception through the understanding of the law, and we will change our perception when we really understand the law of thinking. I like when he says here, cause force, force some issue whereby we alter or change the trend of thought. So to force an issue then would be to say, this condition no longer stands in my life. I now choose, and I will focus upon, and I will bring through my being, in the law of thinking, a change in my life. So we're going to force some issue that will actually be a place in which we will practice what it means to be at cause instead of at effect. Raymond Hollywell put it very well. He said, man is constantly thinking. He can change his thoughts, but he cannot stop thinking. This thinking power flows in and through him like the very air we breathe. Man's problem then is to direct his power of thinking into constructive channels of expression. It is a scientific fact that no power can act without producing some kind of an effect. And by merely thinking, we are continually producing effects. These effects register and record in daily life. When he says that this thought power is continually flowing, well, it flows to and through us. We can actually photograph this power. I refer to it as pure and adulterated spirit or energy that flows to and through us. And if we're not consciously and deliberately giving a direction then the outside world is going to give it direction. And that's where the confusion takes over and produce confused results. So it's a pretty important thing that we study. We continually have something going on in our mind because that thought power never stops flowing. In this lesson, I love the part where Raymond Hollowell speaks about what it means to have orderly, disciplined, constructive thinking and the kind of mind that actually generates that into what we would call our daily life. And part of that is to pay attention to where we have what I call indulgent thinking, where we let ourselves indulge in impatience or anger or resentments, and we toy in these energies and don't realize the absolute price we pay in the quality of aliveness and what that means in terms of creativity. And actually, at the end of the month, you can measure that in the dollars in your checkbook. Raymond Hawley went on to point out that all action is a result of thought. It determines the conditions of life. And to have better conditions in life, we must first make efforts to organize our thoughts. We wish to gain the best in life, but we do not know how to think correctly. The average person thinks at random. He has no clear design in his mind to which he can frame his thoughts. And so that goes back to, we've got to decide what do we want? What results do we want to get? If he has a design, he does not direct his daily efforts towards it. Most of his thinking is beyond control. It's chaotic, unorganized. And that's why disappointment and failure are always near, for they thrive on indecision. We attract only what we think or create. That is the law of thinking. To achieve success, we must think it. We must work it. We must become it. To advance, we must make some effort to rise. To obtain happiness, we have to adapt our lives to the law of harmony and order. To rise above any limitation, 
We must organize our thinking along constructive lines. If a person wishes to climb a hill, he doesn't sit down at the base and pray to the good Lord to take him to the top. He's got to get up and get walking, but he's got to see himself at the top of the hill, and that's what's going to take him up there. That's exactly right. We attract only what we think or create. So, Bob, what would you say in terms of our listener right now? If we were to follow some kind of a step, we said, okay, I understand the law of thinking now. Okay, I agree with this, that there is a law of thinking and that nature can only grow what's planted in it. My life is the outcome of what I've planted with my thoughts. I do want to shift my thinking to a higher order. I do want to practice not just busyness in the mind, but authentic thinking. What would you say that person then would take this lesson and what would they do in their life? They have to understand they have to bring order to their mind. So they have to have direction. And then they have to think thoughts that are moving in that direction. Most people do just whatever comes along, and that isn't going to work. You have to plan your day. That's something definite will be accomplished towards your aim, towards your ambition. If we have any problems, it is because we are not controlling our ideas. Nature has no problems because she is orderly and disciplined. All the way through Raymond Hollywell's work, he's suggesting we follow nature's methods. He said self-control consists of an organized thought direction. That is, we start out with a well-defined aim or objective, and they think toward it continuously. Not just for 30 minutes, plan our time and our work so that we are working steadily toward the goal. We fill our day so full of constructive duties that there's no room for idle chatter or waste of any kind to enter it. One of the things that has helped me a lot in exactly that practice, I don't start my day after I do my open thinking and my what I call prayer meditation, but then I list my to-bes before I list my to-dos. So I list what I want to be that day. I want to be orderly in my thinking. I want to be focused in my direction. I want to be kind, considerate, all the many things that are the frequency of being that I want to generate and live from that I know are in harmony with the result I want to bring. And behind that, I list my to-dos. It's been very empowering. I have quoted Earl Nightingale probably every time I speak anywhere. And I was always so impressed with what Earl Nightingale accomplished. He was a man of accomplishment. I mean, he really made things happen. And I remember the first time I walked into his office, I saw on the credenza beside his desk a picture of he and his wife being introduced to Queen Elizabeth. And the proverb flashed on my mind, seest thou a man diligent in his business, and he'll stand before kings. I thought, that's literally accurate right up till today. Well, I was having breakfast with him one morning, and whenever I was with him alone, I always had questions in my pocket ready to ask him. And I asked him, how did you ever learn how to master time management? And he looked at me, and he sort of smiled, and he said, I didn't master time management. He said, nobody masters time management. Time can't be managed. He said, I merely manage activities. And then he said, I do essentially what you just said. I make a list of things at night that I'm going to do tomorrow, and then I do them. See, he's got his constructive ideas outlined on paper, and then his thinking is directed toward those directions that he's given to himself. Now, that's a simple rule that will give you extraordinary success. So I would just say that understanding the law of thinking is a very powerful step, but the employment of the law of thinking is where the change happens. Why don't we bring this session in for a landing, Mary, with the words of Henry Van Dyke, in Thoughts Are Things. He said, I hold it true that thoughts are things. They're endowed with body and breath and wings, and that we send them forth to fill the world with good results or ill. That which we call our secret thought speeds forth to Earth's remotest spot, leaving its blessings or its woes like tracks behind it as it goes. And he goes on, We build our future thought by thought. For good or ill, we know it not, yet so the universe was wrought. Thought is another name for fate. Choose then thy destiny and wait, for love brings love and hate brings hate. Those are truly beautiful words, Mary. This is Bob Proctor. And Mary Morrissey. Thank you. Thank you.